So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because you know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. Well, welcome back, everybody. We have Dr. William Sanderson here. You you might have just listened to our last episode uh, talking about mismatch theory, talking about uh, societal polarization, politics, uh, the world going a bit more conservative. Um, on the second uh, part of this interview, we're going to be talking more about um, uh, nuclear threat and destruction of the earth and, and these mismatch theory processes and how we get there. Um, so wh where do you want to get started on uh, basically the potential end of the world here? Yeah. So let's, let's talk about nuclear threat because I think that that's more imminent, I guess, in, in some ways. Um, and let's start uh, with uh, really the maybe the founder of evolutionary biology, E.O. Wilson, who died about a year ago. Uh, and he has a book. Uh, I believe it's uh, Human Nature, maybe the name of the book, I don't remember exactly. But he has a great quote in the book, and I think that's where we want to start. And he says that humans have paleolithic emotions and godlike technology. And that's an interesting way of thinking about mismatch, right, sort of as, as mentioned earlier. So the reality is, that if you will, right, we still have these evolutionary drives for, uh, for aggression, let's say. We'll, we'll sort of focus on aggression here now. Uh, but we have more than our hands or primitive weapon. So, like, we could, we could think of, once again, that sort of, uh, spectrum, if you will, a, as we start this topic on, you know, bare hands, primitive weapons, a sword, a gun, an automatic weapon. And if you think about it, like, who could do more harm? Any one person. Like, what, what could I do more harm with? And you know, I could probably do hardly any harm with my bare hands. And I could do a lot of harm with an automatic, like an AR-15. And the idea is that that is, once again, like classic mismatch theory. So you could get someone who's really angry at the world, so to speak. And if they just had their bare hands, they could do some damage Right, maybe be a serial killer or, or, you know, go into a place, but eventually they're going to be subdued from doing what they're doing. But, you know, an AR-15, well, you could do, you know, in the matter of a minute, a lot more damage. Uh, so I think that, um, what we want to look at here is in, in terms of nuclear threat is what makes us think that there couldn't be the equivalent of a mass shooter's mentality who has access to a nuclear bomb. And I think that could be both, what I used to think was more likely would be kind of more of a rogue organization, maybe a rogue country. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> lately, I don't know if, uh, if, if that's the most likely versus certainly there's been threats about use of nuclear uh, uh, weapons in the Ukrainian crisis. And uh, so, and I think the idea is that, um, you can get someone who's angry enough and maybe humiliated enough uh, to want, once again, retribution. And and one of the ways they could do that is doing a lot of damage. Now, for someone that doesn't have access to a nuclear bomb, it might be the best they could do is an AR-15 in the school, and that's what they choose to do. The question is, can that, men can that same mentality exist in someone that has the ability to do much worse? And I think it does. Why, why would it not have that uh, ability? Uh, and so as a result, we're sort of, uh, you know, um, at in some ways not, again, not sure what to do about this other than just strategically think that it could happen and how we want to manage situations to avoid it because it can happen. We can't assume it can happen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's an interesting, uh, I, I, I wrote something in my uh, blog as well about failure of imagination. It's an interesting concept. I wrote it about the pandemic, which was um, people talked about their interviews like a year before the pandemic, that something like that could happen. That exact, I mean, exactly something like that could happen. I think people saw it like, oh, that's 1918. That was, you know, that's so, that's historical. 
And what I think I found most interesting is I remember the days before the pandemic. So it was what March of 20, right? And, uh, that, uh, that the pandemic was like full force in Europe and the U.S. still wasn't doing anything about it mm-hmm. <laughs> in the U.S. And it sort of struck me. I'm like, well, why aren't we like getting masks in place or, you know, get the hospitals ready or whatever. And there was almost this sense like, since it's never happened to us, like we couldn't imagine it happening. Now it happened, <laughs> right? Of course it was going to happen, right? With globalization. Uh, so, um, so I, so I think that's one of our limitations is this failure of imagination. If it hasn't happened, it's hard for us to imagine it happening. And I think it allows us to underestimate risks. And so, and I don't, I, you know, I, I don't, um, in terms of like political advisement. So, I mean, certainly we need to be concerned about who has access to these things and work very strongly to, to not have rogue organizations or states uh, access uh, these um, uh, weapons. But I think also maybe the way we deal with other parties that have them is worth thinking about from a human nature perspective. And I guess I'm going to come back to this idea of mass shooters where they often feel humiliated. And right, and, that, and that's, once again, their revenge, right? They're focused on revenge, even though they're misdirecting the revenge. Could be innocent people they've had nothing to do with, right? But that's their focus. They feel like they've been badly treated by society and they're going to get back in some ways. And, uh, you know, I kind of look at the way the Christ, the, the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis is handled now. I wonder if we're actually considering you know, humiliation as a factor that could increase the likelihood of threat uh, Mm. because it's definitely been used in the media and by the, you know, uh, by the politicians or advisors. Um, So, so that's, uh, so I I think that's the idea there. Now, this was something that was more abstract even a year ago, but I think is really, there was more concern about South Korea, but obviously they didn't have the, the right, I'm sorry, uh, North Korea, but they didn't have the right, technology to really be a major threat at this point. But I think uh, certainly this has taken a turn in the wrong direction uh, more recently. And so the idea would be, once again, that it's the aggressive impulse, but it's not bare hands. It's not a handgun or, or sword or a handgun or even an automatic weapon. It's something that could kill you know, millions of people at once. And so what's going to mismatch is the emotions exist to want to do that in a subset of people, but now the technology exists to be able to pull it off. Uh, and might this very much map on to the, the conversation that, that we're having in, in the last episode about um, a, a rejection or polarization and then aggressive impulse? So if you've been humiliated or you say humiliated, I was talking about rejection. I think it's pretty much kind of like the the same construct underneath here where society has, uh, you feel like society has done you wrong and pushed you out. Um, At a societal level, um, if there's an out group that is ousting you from resource and from the social thing, then that aggressive impulse might kick in because for survival, you'd want to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like, like, like I guess with the, the mass shooter mentality here, that if, if it gets down to where you feel rejected enough by everybody, everybody becomes the out group. Right. Yeah. And so, so that- then that aggressive impulse happens, but rather than it being this, this organization versus this organization, this country versus this country, it's me versus society. So, uh, it's like an evolutionary trip up that, yeah. that it just got so narrowed. Right. You yeah, know, I, I think, yes, absolutely. That's, that's the concern where, you know, if you will, like if the fear in the past, I think was like, you have a group that either has nothing to lose or, based on their beliefs, has something to gain by some, mm-hmm. like, you know, um, uh, martyrdom or something positive that comes from, you know, uh, eliminating much of the world, uh, to uh, even just self-defense and revenge for humiliation. I mean, these are the things that drive human aggression. They drive torture. And um, I think that looking at it on a more, you know, international stage, countries, uh, functioning that way, it would be uh, important. And, you know, sort of similar to the point about U.S. polarization, I think, once again, our tendency to see things in a non-nuanced way, it's black and white, contributes to these ideas versus like, hey, you know what? 
maybe we played a role in this, but but also they played a role in this, and how are we going to negotiate that? Uh, and I feel like that's something that's very much lost uh, in the process. Is uh, It's like, once again, someone's wrong, someone's right, and there's no understanding in between that. Uh, something referred to as like motivated reasoning. You just pay attention to the information that you, that supports what you believe already, and uh, and, and that and that creates all types of problems. Hmm. Um, I, you know, you mentioned with the nuclear, um, like our, our nuclear destruction as a species, more so about this like rogue person or rogue group doing something. But but is there fear about it being a little bit less rogue and more like mainstream? Well, now I think there is because it's, it's been part of the discussion. Uh, certainly in the uh, in the current conflict and in, in Ukraine and and Russia, so you know it's hard to know exactly what if it was to happen, how uh, other countries would respond. Right? There's theories of mass of mutual destruction, so to speak. That was the, the whole basis of the Cold War with Russia during the 1980s, which is both sides had too much to lose. But the thing you worry about, right, let's get from an emotional standpoint, is what if one side doesn't have so much to lose anymore? It, does that make them more likely to engage in horrific, you know, kind of protective, uh, face-saving behavior to some degree? And and then how do people respond to that, right? Not, I don't mm -hmm. suggest they have the roadmap to that other than this idea that we are emotional beings and we may not always make the best choice to um, reduce uh, escalation and uh, right and, it, and it, for everyone it can be fed into this idea like of being treated wrong and needing revenge and uh, that could be an escalation that could literally um, annihilate the whole planet mm -hmm. well you know one and I don't know too much about this this research vein but the, the bit I do know is that one factor for radicalization is social rejection and feeling like you've been harmed from from society mm -hmm. and then another group says we love you we'll take you and uh these other people are really bad like we see it yeah uh you know come, come join us so this whole concept of of being rejected by some sort of out group or humiliated or being harmed it just really seems to be a very strong driver of a lot of things that we do as humans Right. And remember, it, just to come back to the evolutionary discussion here about this point, it, it's in our nature to want revenge. Because think about the function of revenge. When you get revenge, the other party knows not to do what they did to you before. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's evolved. Uh, other species engage in revenge as well. Uh, but the problem is that this isn't just I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sort of making this light, but this is not just going over and like, you know, punching someone in the face who's wronged you, right? That's your revenge. And they maybe know not to wrong you again. This is something that could be hard to roll back in terms of the impact. And going back to EO Wilson's comments, uh, quote, the idea that, right? So that paleolithic emotion of revenge is in our DNA as a result of an adaptation from evolution. But the difference is the ability to strike revenge could lead to literally, in the most severe example, end of species. I mean, I'm not minimizing. There's wars that are built on revenge factors where you know hundreds of thousands or millions of people can be killed. So this this is not. I, I'm just sort of taking the most extreme, right? But it could be you know everything from like a revenge murder <laughs> on a on a, a most basic level, like on a revenge homicide. You know, gang activity to all the way to the other extreme, which would be nuclear annihilation. Mm -hmm. um, but but some of our, our motives are at the individual level, meaning what's best for me, uh, or maybe like a smaller group. And some some of the stuff it's what's best for. So this might not be best for me, but I think it's what's best for my society mm -hmm. or or my larger my larger out group. And I feel like we have both of these processes going on because people sacrifice themselves for the greater for the greater good, right? So there is part of us as a species that's willing to take some sort of harm or negative degradation to the self if it's going to protect our group that we strongly care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of status in, in that idea of like being the protector and taking risks. 
and so on. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, so, but I think the problem once again becomes where the, um, you know, where the behavior is of that magnitude, right? So once again, it's, it's one thing to go in and, and, you know, defend your group with a gun, let's say, and that does a certain amount of harm. Uh, I think, but the, my main point here is that that same brain it has nukes. Could, 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 <laughs> could, you know, yeah, be a person nukes. that has nukes and we're just emotional beings. We're sort of slaves to our emotions. And so even though it may not be a rational behavior, it, it, you know, it could be an irrational behavior and, but it could lead to that, to the behavior itself. And that behavior then can escalate because other people are going to respond possibly irrationally as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and probably people thinking are, are thinking now like, well, I couldn't get my hand on a nuke if I wanted to. Uh, but in the future though, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's science and there's instructions. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I think I read somewhere that, that even at this point, that uh, this this is more the concern about sort of rogue states or individuals would be the idea though that um, I believe that they said like in in sort of a you know a, a regular sized suitcase like a fifty pound suitcase that uh, with with nuclear material like you could pretty much take out Manhattan so you know if someone had access to that it's not such a you know we, we carry fifty pound bags around when we get on a plane mm -hmm. so uh, it's not so difficult I mean obviously the, the science is difficult. But if you had access to it, it's not. So this threat will just continue with tech. I think that's your point here. It will just continue with technology. Yeah. And um, I was thinking about what, what you're saying versus fists, swords, guns, nukes. Uh, we keep creating weapons that we could deploy further away that causes mm -hmm. more, right. um, more mass damage. Right. Well, think of drones. We're totally removed from the killing, right? Everyone's removed from it. It's pretty much a video game. And there's concerns about that in terms of mismatch. Yeah, well, I think that's super fascinating. And uh, I think where you're going with it, but but what do you mean by that? So meaning, so you don't, you don't even have human soldiers anymore needing to do the damage where you might have to worry about their lives or their, psych their psychological damage, like in PTSD, you pretty much just have robots, right? A drone is a robot. And it can go out and, and do a lot of damage, putting your own group at no, no risk. So the reward for using a drone is much greater because there's so little risk. Does that make countries more aggressive in the future? I think it could because then countries don't have to contemplate as much the cost that it will be to them other than the financial cost of the drone. Hmm. Um, and, and there's also that, uh, the principle that the less human, the, the more dehumanized. So, so when somebody's in an out group, we, we automatically, uh, have mm -hmm. more dehumanization and the further the out group, the more right. dehumanization. And we have an easier time harming people that we have dehumanized. Um, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. why, well, right. I was just going to say that I think Conrad Lorenz, who wrote the book on aggression, who sort of kind of studied aggression in humans and animals, but it was in the 60s. So I don't think he had a sense of the technology to come, but he kind of made the point that most humans would have it difficult if they were, let's say, strangling someone, to, that they would actually get feedback along the way that would make them feel sorry for the person at some level. The problem with a gun is you don't get, it's too late, right? It's done in a second. And certainly drones, right? There's no feedback whatsoever, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the further away you are from it, the more that you can. Well, I don't know if it's moral just the less moral justification you have to make, right, to your group, because there's to less your, cost. Yeah, but right. what about your? And also, I, I, well, now I know we're talking about side, but even intrapsychically, like for yourself, for yourself, right? Yes, because you're not yeah. seeing it, you're not witnessing it, right? Yeah, you're not seeing yeah. it, you're not witnessing, so you could reasonably you know, distance yourself from the thing. You don't even have the memory of it. You can't even, you know, if you hit a button and it launches and something does something versus you doing yeah. something, you have that vivid live memory mm -hmm. right. versus understanding conceptually what happened. Correct. Correct. Yes. And I, you know, um, I mean, you just think about in the news, we, we will hear about these military actions that, that happen, um, you know, uh, and um, it's kind of like the same process there, right? The, the, the thing happened, the destruction happened, but, we weren't a part of it. So there is some level of distancing that we have from the mm -hmm. actual action of what happened Correct. versus seeing it or yeah. being Look, there. Look, I mean, the, the United States did not allow pictures to come from countries that we were at war at in the last war, which was very different than the Vietnam War. 
And right. So there were legal pictures sent back. And I think some of the photojournalists went to jail for sending them back. And the reason is, right, no one wants you to really see what's going on. Right. It's, it would be horrific. It could change public opinion. So uh, but so the yeah, so once again, like everybody kind of knows this and, and they make rules to, uh, you know, to try to, uh, uh, you know, deal with it as, as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That- and when I when I had asked like last like what what are some things that we could we could uh, do do about this one of this was like lower social media use for for the outside but do you think um, working on humanization would also be a good thing here to to lower potential tensions just because when we see people as human we tend to be less violent yeah I I think I mean I think that would that would help I mean I feel like things have moved in the opposite direction right now yes, for some of the yes. economic factors that you. Uh, that you talked about. I mean, I think, um, I think in this area, most likely, you know, evolutionary theory would say, look, this could really happen. Don't think just because it happened has not happened the way we thought it could. It, it won't, right? That could change tomorrow or that could change in five minutes. I think though, uh, this is really uh, in, um, the, the idea of, of those who are taking this threat seriously, where there's tangible ways to try to reduce, you know, just the stockpile. Which increases the likelihood of these things happening. I'm not sure there's a human nature um, hack that could go on with this well, because this yeah. is mainly in the hands of a few people that have ultimate power, and so they're kind of operating very, you know, very differently with it. But well, I, I would say, you know, I'm, I, part of my uh, point, I think, of you know, the discussion today is taking these things more seriously. Like this is, yes. and just seeing that the direction that they could go, not because it's an anomaly, but because it's our nature. And a lot of the interventions that we do, I'm not talking about like therapy, just interventions to, to, to solve a problem. It's all about probabilities. It decreases po- probability, but it doesn't mean that it's going to make the outcome zero. So correct. even if we correct psychological processes, things are going on to reduce the risk of someone taking a nuke and doing something awful, that it's still not going to be zero. Right. And when you're talking about a substantial nuke that you just said could blow up Manhattan, uh, you, you know, even if we lower the probability, if one person is not in that probability is in the probability of yes and has access, that could be a serious, serious mass destruction problem. Correct. Right. Right. Every little thing you could do would matter. And and like I said, I, I think I wish I had more to say about intervention. Uh, but a lot of this is once it, it's a bit like more of an insight is what I would say sure. is my goal is saying, look, this is part of who we are. It's not an anomaly. This is not this is not like some pathology. This is who we are. And that's why we can do it. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's why it can happen. And I think when we take that seriously, then I think we might, you know, approach situations differently versus some fantasy like, oh, no, no, this is not part of human nature. No, no one would ever do that or, or this could never happen. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So by the way, do you want to, I, just for time's sake, do you want to move on to three? Yeah, please. Which is, yeah, this is a, this is a simpler one, by the way. And so, you know, destruction of the earth, but not including uh, nuclear, which could be destruction of the earth. I guess one of the, the big ones right now that's worth talking about is climate change. And I think, uh, but, but uh, you know, there's other things like, um, you know, species becoming extinct or deforestation. And some of those things might even be related to climate change. The one thing I would say here, though, is, and this is a slightly different process than the things we've talked about, it's just worth thinking about that human evolution, humans were not future oriented. They were much more in the moment, right? Because you didn't, there wasn't really a sense of future. It was like, am I going to survive today? Uh-huh. And as a result, I think that we're not good at sort of forecasting our current situation to the future and how that may uh, matter. I'll just get a quick maybe two quick examples that don't have to do with this, but let's say as an example, like people saving for their retirement, right? Well, the reason social security became important is that people weren't geared towards doing that. So, right. right? Yes. So you had to have a, you know, a, a national policy that said, listen, we're going to take this money from you and uh, we're going to put it away so that when you can't work anymore, you're going to have money because people have difficulty, um, saving 
and sort of depriving themselves in the moment, right? The, the only people that that could work for maybe is people that have lots of resources where they might not have to worry about it. But that's not true of, you know, 90% of the population. So this idea that, you know, you want it, you, you're more in the moment. What I, I want this now, and the future is harder to deal with, projecting out like, oh, I, I'll retire and have no money, then what am I going to do? Right, I think Social Security is a great example of that. And the other one, I'll kind of come back to the eating example, where I think what happens is people often don't connect the dots well as to like, well, yeah, you know what, this won't hurt you now, but like when you get to be 50 or 60, it's going to be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And people really struggle with, you know, when if, you know, thinking about how their behavior, you know, 30 or 40 years before could impact their health status later on, whether it be not enough exercise or eating the wrong things. So it's, it's that idea mapped onto something that's even more um, abstract, which would be something like climate change, as an example. And whatever, not even getting into, like, are humans responsible for that or not? But let's just say they are, just for the sake of this. Well, that's a hard, that's a tall order to really enact it, because it would actually mean, you know, I'll, I'll use this sort of bro, uh, general term for a second, depriving ourselves now for future generations. Right. You'd have to pay more for a car or for energy. Right. We'd have to do without things. This, this is a very costly endeavor. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's not a worthwhile endeavor, but the point is it doesn't come cheap. And I think that when you see even people in favor of it, when they see like, oh, you know what a good way to solve this problem is? Raise gas to $10 a gallon in the U.S. That would definitely help. But we know that consumption is based on price. Yeah. But most people wouldn't want that, even those mm -hmm. in favor of of, um, of of climate change. Or hey, you know, I, I know what? Let's have no more planes flying anymore. That'll that'll help enormous amount. People like to travel. So my point here is that we're just not built for a future orientation because evolution wasn't about the future. Like you had to escape that tiger today. You had to find that food now. When you had it, just eat all you can. Don't worry about tomorrow. And I think that is very much human mentality, probably even applying to those first two. It's more of a broad concept, but trying to uh, uh, also applying to those first two areas where I think part of it is that people have trouble in general. We all have trouble like thinking about the future because we're much more focused in the present. Mm. Well, there are also, you know, like um, you think about like early adopters, late adopters and the, the different stages, you know, in the middle, like there's some like early adopters really sounding the alarm on climate change and this, that and the other. At this point, it's not super early, um, but there seems to be like a mentality in the middle of, ah, we'll figure it out. Ah, right. they'll figure it out. Right, right. Um, Technology will come to the rescue, which it may, right? It's possible. It, it's but possible. It's but certainly what, happened with our health status, by the way. I mean, people would be dying left and right if it wasn't for medicine and surgeries because of our bad behavior, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's been an example. So the quality of life has suffered, but people are living because of medicine and, and surgeries. Yeah, it is, but do you guys talk, does evolutionary, like, do they talk about this process of, eh, we'll figure it out or they'll figure it out? Like, kind of just like having this, because for the most part, human beings are not so optimistic in their thinking. But for this one, when it comes to mutual yeah. destruction and our own thing, we're like, eh, we'll figure it out. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure I would put that in the optimistic category versus like just not wanting to deal with it. And maybe what's again, not equipped to deal with it. That would be my point. That we all have this, you know, what I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm human as well. So we all have these same tendencies. Uh, and, uh, so, right. So I think that's more about like, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't want to sacrifice this now for that. So I'm just assuming that scientists will figure out how to like cool the earth down or whatever needs to be done in the future. And I, I would just to be clear in terms of, um, I wonder, I know that there's you know, a significant portion of the population that takes this very seriously. I still wonder though, and I, I, I don't, I'm, this is, this is a hypothesis, but I still wonder if people realize what it really would take for this to happen, whether as many people would be on board. Because, I mean, you saw like gas prices almost drove the election. <laughs> You know, like, right, that, that was like a major factor in the way the uh, people were voting in the election was inflation, but particularly gas prices. 
series of articles on this. And, you know, to really do this right, gas prices would have to, you know, go up mm-hmm. significantly and uh, to, to, you know, reduce consumption. It's pretty much basic economics, that what's happening with interest rates to try to cool inflation. And uh, so I don't know, maybe this is pessimistic, but I don't know if all the people that say they really want to do it could sacrifice in the moment for the future, right? And 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 that and I think that that's what we see. So people will say it, but I think then if you ask people to make these changes, you know, it's more difficult. And I, I, I mean, I, I, these are small examples, but I know uh, I, I believe it might have even been Al Gore as an example was like flying around a private plane, you know, a private jet to. Um, Talk about climate give talks change. on climate change. <laughs> now, okay, okay, it's in the scheme of things, like one person doing that. But I think that that's kind of like what concerns people is where there is this like blind spot uh, about what you're doing, even if you're for the the principle. I think he did an amazing service to make us aware of it. But the question is, can we really enact these things in the way that we need to? Mm-hmm. So a little, a little self check, and of course, I, I saw this on TikTok, and I know that they splice the the feedback that they get, the responses that they get to make some sort of narrative. But somebody on TikTok was walking around and said, "How do you feel about free college?" Uh, for, for everybody in the state. And people say, yes, great, on board. And he said, okay, please sign this petition. And then when they signed it to the next of it, he said, please write how much you're willing to contribute of your paycheck every year in order to do this. And of course, every right. every person that they spliced on there said, oh, no, 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 never mind. But if you're listening right yeah, now yeah. and you think in free college for whatever, if I ask you this question, how much are you willing to pay per year for it to have it? Is the answer zero? Uh, are, are you mm-hmm. really willing to take money out of your paycheck to make it happen? Uh, and to this point of, uh, we might have ideals, but are we as a species willing to actually, how much sacrifice are we willing to do for our de- our ideals to come true? Right. And I would say, right, so the idea can land, right? I think the idea is like, oh, this seems to be a problem. Look, we're seeing, you know, hurricane in November in Florida. That's a problem. It's unusual. Right? We're seeing all these unusual events. I don't deny, uh, I, I don't doubt people's um, acceptance of the importance of it. I'm just wondering about whether or not People, humans are capable of doing something that's so future oriented, kind of for future generations, right? Where, where they're, they, they're built for a kind of more in the moment types of decision making. And, and this one would be costly and something that they might not see. So it makes it particularly challenging. But uh, yeah, it would be, I think it would be interesting to see, you know, to see objectively if there were some of these changes made. But, uh, you know, I, I think it would, uh, you know, definitely there would have to be sa- significant economic sacrifice to make it happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, not to mention other countries are not on board and so on. But certainly, you know, whatever one country could do would make a difference, especially, uh, you know, a major um, one with a big carbon footprint. But, uh, yeah, um, so I think, though, the, the idea is whether it be that, uh, or, or similar issues about the future, I think it's hard for us to really, f- personal health, um, you know, uh, savings and so on. It really is a challenge for people to, uh, you know, to kind of enact the behavior, not agree with the idea. I think you gave a great example with the, with the free college, right? I mean, even by the way, the student loan thing where it was a popular idea, uh, that cancel X amount of student loan debt. And then all of a sudden people started to realize what it was going to cost them. <laughs> Ta- you know, the and tax they didn't wise. like it so much. And if they didn't have, so if you had a lot of student debt, you loved it. Mm-hmm. But if you didn't have a lot of student debt, you're like, well, why am I bailing this person out of their student debt? So it all of a sudden, all of a sudden became not such a good idea. And that's my point is it's not the principle always that matters. It's kind of what behavior that has to go along with it. Is there any other uh, psychological uh, principles that we have besides this lack of uh, willingness to invest in preventing future harm that might be driving the risk of climate change and some other these other uh, global disaster uh, uh, disasters yeah. that could be coming? I would just say the lack of imagination again, which I think is an important one. And uh, right, this is an area that's actually researched. But so the idea is, if it hasn't happened, it's harder for us to get our mind around, right? People were talking about a pandemic for, for decades and exactly, I mean, you could see reports, you could see interviews two years before the pandemic of someone describing exactly what happened with COVID, a respiratory, uh, 
dr- driven pandemic and with globalization, what it could do. And right. Once again, no, I don't, I, I, I study worry. No one was worrying about a pandemic, <laughs> you know, of all the things people were worrying about. I, maybe, maybe there might've been a handful of people worrying about uh, a pandemic. So the failure to imagination is big because I don't know if people real, and I don't know if anybody really knows what the consequences of climate change could be, but it, you know, it certainly could be, you know, cataclysmic from, you know, if, if, if what scientists are saying are true, uh, you know, in terms of flooding and, 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 you know, all, ty- you know, just the climate in general. So, yeah, so I, I would put failure of imagination into there as well. And, and do you when mean it happens, like happens, we'll take it seriously, like a pandemic, right? We, we took it seriously. Yeah. It's kind of like this thing, like, um, we're good at if it's a positive, like we're good if it's there, but we're not so good at seeing what's not there. Right, right. Especially if it hasn't um, happened, right? Yeah, especially so, if it hasn't right, happened. It, right. yeah. like, so I think we would take in the future, let, let's say the pandemic resolves and, you know, 10 years from now, maybe there's some possibility. I think we would take it much differently because we've had it already. Mm-hmm. Right. And we know we know what it what it could do. But if it's been uh, 200 years and we're still here and there's somehow not another pandemic since yeah, then. Yeah, so right. so cu- cultural say, consciousness one, one, disappeared, then yeah. we'd probably be in the same boat again. But I would say 100 years, just just eliminate the people that had suffered from it before. <laughs> and uh, right, oh, or, sure. or most of them, you know, and then that's it. It's, it's off the radar screen. Yeah, because you don't see it. Right. And I guess that's the same risk with wars too, right? Because yeah. because World War II, uh, you know, where we've had these big global. I, I wasn't around for for something like that. Yeah, you know, and 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 I'm gonna have to stop that. But just to go back, that's what's another good point of failure to imagination and relevant here. What um what I, I was listening to this podcast, and I don't remember exactly who it was, so I would give them credit. But they actually made a similar point, and this was a historian in saying, you know. You, we went through like this 20 year period where there was so much peace and prosperity that people lost sight of like who the players were in these different countries. And if you will, they were just waiting for the right time to, to jump and try to take a, advantage of the situation. And, uh, but, but what happened is we couldn't imagine that because we had this different idea like, Oh, these people want like what we want in a way. And they were talking about specifically China and Russia. The idea that people thought like, oh, they were going to be democracies or, uh, you know, countries that focus more on uh, human rights and so on. But it didn't happen. And the person made the point it was because we got lulled into this sense because it wasn't happening. And meanwhile, right, these leaders play the long game. They're not elected. (laughs) Right. So they're 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 in charge and they play a long game. So they don't worry about it has to be done in the next four years. And, uh, and there's also being lulled into it, but like me, I, I, w- I was born in Reagan, lived through Clinton. It, you know what I mean? Like my, my formative years, things were mostly pretty. Economy was good. Yep. There, I mean, of course, there's always war, but there wasn't yep. like, no, you know what I mean? Be- legit, things were pretty okay. Objectively the best time in history in yeah. terms of all that stuff. So, right, exactly. And uh, so, um, you know, I think I think that, but if you, but people, let's say even myself, where I was born in 1960. You had a sense of the Cold War. You had, there was no relations with China until Nixon. So these places were seen as more problematic and then they were not. And now all of a sudden they're back on the radar screen. So yeah, it's complicated, but, uh, and, um, but I, I think it's more the, the idea that, right, lulled or like failure to, because it's not happening to think things would change. And, and the, by the, the, the person in this podcast just made the point that, like we're really bad at taking history into account. It's almost like we don't think it matters. And so we form our opinions on the moment. And if it's going well now, we assume it's going to go well and not lose, and we lose sight of really what's, what's going on, including for mm-hmm. ourselves, by the way. So it's not to, to cast aspersions on any particular country. Um, right. No, no one's, uh, you know, go, going back to the, the very beginning, right. We're all driven by the same things. And, uh, so, uh, Every, if you want to go back to the country level, every major power has done things that in some ways exploited other groups because that's part of those mechanisms. 
Um, do you, when I was talking about early, early adopter theory, do, do you know what I was talking about before? Like where, like when there's a product or, or some yeah. sort of behavior shift, there's like early adopters. I don't know how many tiers they give it, but picture like there's five stages where there's people that do it really early. Right. And then after then another group will do it. And then there's the middle and then there's the late adopters and, and the people that are somewhere in the middle. I, I, uh, kind of see that also with like, like society things as a whole. And I actually think that like um, it's healthy for society to yeah. have different tiers of how quickly we adopt anything. Cause yeah. if we move too quickly, we could go down a bad idea and everything could blow up. And if we move too slowly, then we don't move forward. And so when you have that balanced approach of moving forward, it's actually helpful. So I don't think it's an accident that we have this. Right. Um, but no, it's, by seeing... way, it's a really, it's a really interesting point. And so the, the, the part that I would support with that is in, 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 you know, fuel and evolution, like everything is normally distributed, right? If we mm -hmm. look at height or personality types, if we measure, right, er, all, all traits are normally distributed. So that's interesting, right? That, that it's almost just suggesting a normal distribution, yes, absolutely right? Absolutely a normal distribution. So to speak, right? Which is that, yeah, you, some people jump on, but you wouldn't want everybody to jump on. That wouldn't nope. be functional. That'd be awful. So people <laughs> come slowly and then, and then people come later. Yeah, that, that's really an interesting idea, of like almost like this cognitive mechanism that's evolved at the societal the group, level, at, at the group level. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and I think they also showed that with neuroticism, our levels of neuroticism fall like that because you want the early detection system, the people right. that start to look at it, and then the people at the end that when you know they're freaked out, you're like, oh man, right. there's yeah. really a problem here. But the thing is that that also means that on average, the most amount of people are kind of one foot in, one foot out. Right. Uh, uh, on issues when you look at a normal curve. Right. All right. So before I let you go, is there anything else that you wanted to bring up that we had uh, missed that you wanted to talk about today? I think that's it. I think we covered the the areas and the, and the basic points. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. I mean, like I said, said before, I just love evolutionary psychology. I think that we need to be thinking more about how our evolutionary mechanisms impact us individually as a society. And hopefully people will start talking about this more because acceptance of our biases, right? And this is to your point, is one of the first steps into doing something different. But if we don't have that insight, then how in the world are we going to do something differently? Yeah, no, that's, that's my main point of all this is I think we have to see us as we are, and then we can make better decisions rather than, once again, going back to the idea of the stories we tell ourselves, which may not be who we are. Who we are. Well, again, I appreciate you coming on, taking the time, and it's always a pleasure having you. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason.